here at the law school, and I'm delighted to introduce you um, or introduce to you our next panel um, on taxation, compensation, and judicial independence. Um, our panelists are uh, first Jonathan Enton, who has been a professor of law and political science uh, here at Case. Well, he's been here at Case since 1984. Um, he has taught constitutional law, administrative law, um, a course on courts, public policy, and social change, as well as a Supreme Court seminar. And he was law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, um, which actually I knew before, but what I did not know until today is that he lobbied, also lobbied Sandra Day O'Connor when she was a member of the Arizona legislature. So how many people can say that? Um, <laughs> He was, uh, he's currently at work on a book about equal protection and as well as the project he's talking about today uh, on the compensation clause. Professor Enton's um, silent partner in this enterprise <laughs> is Eric Jensen, also of the Case Law School. He's not actually going to be um, giving the principal presentation, but um, <laughs> He's not an intentional presenter, but <laughs> he will probably jump in. He is the David L. Brennan Professor of Law here at Case. Um, and as Professor Enton mentioned earlier today, Professor Jensen is an expert in tax law. Um, he's recently published a book entitled The Taxing Power. And an article in, he also has a recent article in Constitutional Commentary on uh, the 16th Amendment. Uh, finally, um, our third panelist who will be responding to um, the presentation is Mark Miller, who is professor and chair of the government department at Clark University. Uh, at Clark, he teaches courses on constitutional law, U.S. judicial politics, comparative courts and the law, the U.S. Congress, and lawyers in American politics. Um, he served as both a congressional fellow and the judicial fellow at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and he is also editor of a recently published book entitled Making Policy, Making Law, an Interbranch Perspective, published in 2004, which uh, discusses the relationship between the federal courts and other um, government actors. Um, so I will turn it over to them now. Thank you, Jesse. Um, our role here, I think, is to serve as the bridge uh, between Professor Amar uh, and Professor Tushnet. Uh, you, can, you can kind of tell that because this paper actually does, as I said, have something to do with taxation. But in fact, there is a bit of a bridge. After all, Professor Amar uh, talked a little bit about compensation earlier, and uh, he also made a passing reference to a case involving carriages. Uh, that is a tax case. Um, <laughs> it's United States against Hilton. It was decided in 1796. And um, my, my friend Jensen, uh, who has accused me in print of spending 13 weeks on Marbury, or 10 weeks on Marbury, uh, which is a gross misrepresentation in both directions, um, uh, insists that this is a really important case. And, for our purposes, it, it does have some significance because that is a case during the period when the court was issuing seriatim opinions where it was suggested that if the tax statute at issue in that case uh, were an unapportioned direct tax, it would, of course, be in, uh, inconsistent with the Constitution and the court would have no choice but to strike it down. But, of course, it wasn't a direct tax and, therefore, they could avoid the issue. Um, now, I should say... Something else about uh, the relationship, or my relationship with, with, uh, with Jensen. I said earlier that if there's anything uh, intentionally funny in, in this paper, it's his doing. Um, you, you need to understand that um, I have been a character on his tax exams for some years now. Um, and to give you a sense about, about the way I appear, um, one year, he had me moonlighting as a barber, because I like to split hairs. Um, <laughs> and uh, he had a picture, a picture hanging on the wall in the shop uh, that, that leaned to the left um, with the comment that I had no idea what the intent of the framer was. Um, so 
Um, on, against that backdrop, let, let me try to be serious for a few minutes. Um, judicial independence is a principle central to Article Three. Life tenure furthers independence, but the founders thought that life tenure by itself would not be sufficient. How independent, how impartial would a tenured judge be if Congress could adjust his or her compensation downward for not deciding a high-profile case in the desired way, or if Congress could give the judge a bonus for coming to the correct conclusion. Now, it's not a perfect solution to the problem, but the Compensation Clause provides that federal judges, Article III federal judges, shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuation in office. Uh, it's clear from the founding debates that the clause was intended to protect federal judges from external pressures that might affect judges' impartiality. The founders debated whether the clause went far enough or whether it went too far, but there was no disagreement about the stated purpose. The founders realized that guaranteed tenure would mean little if a judge's compensation could be tied to the content of decisions. Two questions were discussed in the founding debates, whether judicial compensation should be absolutely fixed for any sitting judge so as to protect independence, and primarily a concern raised by anti-federalists, whether the clause gave too much independence to judges. But whatever disagreements the framers had, they all agreed that the compensation clause was actually about protecting judicial independence. Now, some founders, notably Madison, thought that the clause didn't go far enough to protect impartiality. Uh, Madison wanted to make sure that Congress could not change compensation at all, either up or down, analogous to, as Professor Amar pointed out, the provisions relating to the president. Um, now, there was an obvious practical problem with capping compensation because judges might serve for longer than four or eight years, uh, and Madison, in fact, suggested at one point that perhaps compensation should be uh, tied to the value of some other thing, something of per permanent value, like wheat, for example. Um, <laughs> Governor Morris thought this was uh, not the most plausible suggestion. Uh, I guess this is the not by bread alone theory of compensation. <laughs> Um, and in any event, uh, Madison, despite repeated efforts, uh, was outvoted, uh, and the, therefore the Compensation Clause prohibits only reductions in compensation. Now, the Anti-Federalists were worried that the Constitution would make the judges too independent. They wanted to keep – they thought that, that it would be possible, or should be possible, uh, in a time of economic distress to have a general across-the-board reduction in federal expenditures, including uh, the salaries not only of judges but of all other uh, federal officials, um, that argument lost. Now, the idea of protection against diminution uh, in compensation at one level is pretty straightforward. You can see it in United States against Will, a case that is more noted for the Court's discussion of the rule of necessity. After all, every member of the Court had a financial interest in the outcome of the case. But the Court said in United States against Will, and it's the, the very fact that it took until 1980 for this issue to reach the Supreme Court should tell you something about the clarity of the Compensation Clause, that the Reduction of, a, of compensation that had already taken effect clearly violates the Compensation Clause, even if the reduction involves a pay raise that had been effect, in effect literally for hours, because one of the provisions at issue in Will involved the President signing of a bill on the first day of the fiscal year that, that eliminated a cost of living adjustment for judges. That piece of the Compensation Clause is pretty straightforward. There are some questions about when judicial compensation vests at a particular level. Uh, the Court 
suggested that at least some prospective uh, elimination of cost of living adjustments in, in will would be permissible. But there has been continuing litigation on this issue. Um, as recently as 2002, the Federal Circuit uh, rejected a claim uh, brought by some sitting judges who claimed that the uh, cost of living adjustments for uh, sitting judges had been discriminatorily um, denied. Um, the Supreme Court denied certiorari over three dissents with a very with a 17-page opinion by uh, Justice Breyer explaining why this was a serious issue that the court should take up. Um, now, it's also I think worth noting. I don't want to sound like Janine Perot. I'm not going to get lost if this page uh, disappears on me. Um, uh, the, the framers clearly didn't think very much about taxation issues, uh, and we're going to talk, we talk in this paper uh, about some tax issues. One of the reasons the framers didn't have much to say about taxation uh, and the compensation clause was because uh, there wasn't much uh, sense that the federal government could tax incomes of anybody, uh, never mind uh, judges. Uh, what is clear I is that uh, in the direct taxes that Congress levied uh, before the Civil War, uh, there was never an exception for federal judges. Um, now, nevertheless, during the 19th century and during the first part of the 20th century, there were a few little detours along the path. Uh, some of those detours suggest the sort of self-serving judicial behavior that, that uh, we've heard a little bit about um, earlier. Um, one notable example, uh, during the Civil War, the federal government imposed an income tax. Uh, Chief Justice Taney objected to paying the tax uh, because he thought that imposing the tax on Article III judges violated the Compensation Clause. Um, he did not litigate the case. He thought it would be inappropriate uh, for him to litigate, after all, what judge could impartially decide such a case. Um, nonetheless, um, by 1872, the federal government decided to refund the taxes that federal judges and presidents had paid uh, during that period. There then follows in the following the 20th century uh, three cases between 1920 uh, and 1939 that form the backdrop for the uh, Supreme Court's 2001 decision in the United States against Hatter. I'm not going to run through all these cases in great detail, but just to give a, a quick summary, um, the 16th Amendment is ratified in 1913. Um, the initial income tax uh, enacted under the 16th Amendment exempted federal judges, but by the time of the First World War, federal judges were taxed. Um, a federal district judge, um, Walter Evans, uh, who, was, who had been on the bench uh, before the 1918 tax law extended uh, to federal judges, filed suit claiming that taxing him would violate the Compensation Clause. The Supreme Court in 1920 ruled in his favor over a dissent by Justices Holmes and Brandeis. Uh, in 1925, uh, in a case called Miles against Graham, uh, a member of the old U.S. Court of Claims uh, who was appointed after the tax of 1918 uh, went into effect raised the same claim. Um, although the court might have distinguished the cases on the basis that, that uh, Judge Evans might have been thinking about the total compensation package he would get when he went on the bench and that presumably uh, tax, the taxing of his income would not be part of his calculus. Same couldn't have been said uh, for, uh, for Judge Graham. Um, the court didn't pay any attention to that distinction, simply said that taxing uh, Judge Graham was also in conflict with the compensation clause. Um, then in 1939, uh, an Eighth Circuit judge named uh, Joseph Woodruff, uh, who was 
appointed after a 1932 statute that said that taxes levied under the 1932 Act would apply to all judges appointed after the effective date of the statute. He made the same sort of argument that uh, Evans and Graham had made. And in 1939, uh, in O'Malley against Woodruff, uh, Justice Frankfurter wrote an opinion for the court that essentially rejected the argument uh, and said that, um, that Miles against Graham was really not very well reasoned, uh, but, chose, but the court does not overrule. Miles doesn't say anything about Evans against Gore on which the court had relied. Um, for the con law people among you, you might think about this as analogous to the way the Supreme Court in Brown against Board of Education dealt with Plessy against Ferguson. Everybody understood that the court was repudiating Plessy in Brown, but the court doesn't say so. Same in O'Malley against Woodruff, and that, uh, that is, uh, that's kind of uh, where our uh, background uh, might be. Uh, the important point in O'Malley against Woodruff is that Justice Frankfurter says there's no question here that this tax would have any effect on judicial independence, uh, and that's the flaw in Judge Woodruff's argument. Now, um, I referred earlier uh, to uh, United States against Will just as a, as a, as a backdrop here. Uh, it's worth noting that in Will, the court suggested that there was a second rationale for the compensation clause, not simply to protect judicial independence, um, but also to help recruit people to the federal bench. That is a point that we will come back to, um, but let me jump ahead to the more recent decision uh, in, um, in, uh, in United States against Hatter. Um, Hatter is a case arising from a couple of tax provisions in the early 1980s uh, in, uh, uh, in which Congress extended both the Medicare tax and the old age survivors and, and uh, disability insurance uh, tax, the Social Security tax, uh, to sitting federal judges uh, as well as future ones. Uh, Judge Hatter uh, and a group of other judges who were on the bench in 1983 when this extension uh, took place made filed suit again under the compensation clause when the case got to the Supreme Court. Uh, the court formally overruled Evans against Gore, which had the effect as well of, um, of uh, rejecting uh, Miles against Graham. Um, the court um, in in this case, said there's no problem with extending the Medicare tax to sitting judges, but, and this is a point that we elaborate in the paper and we won't bore you with here, Eric and I uh, uh, were a little bit surprised that the court said that it was unconstitutional uh, to extend the OASDI tax to sitting judges uh, because the court said that was discriminatory against judges. Uh, and we're a little, we think that the reasoning there is at least not straightforward, but that's not the burden of our talk today. Now, the, the emphasis on discrimination is significant because I think it shows a kind of a contrast in approaches to the compensation clause. Will did not say that reduction of, of the salary was unconstitutional because it discriminated against judges. It simply said the compensation clause by its express term says judicial compensation shall not be reduced. Doesn't matter if it's an across the board a reduction or not. So discrimination doesn't matter when we're talking about salary reduction, but apparently for tax purposes, discrimination does matter. The larger point though is that the court says if you are going to impose a non-discriminatory tax that applies to federal judges, there's not going to be a compensation clause issue. Uh, as a practical matter, we're hard pressed to think of very many other tax situations in, in the real world where the issues uh, raised in Evans against Gore and Miles against Graham, O'Malley and Woodruff and, 
and, and, and Hatter uh, will, uh, will become significant. Um, nevertheless, um, there is this other strand of compensation clause jurisprudence. It's actually dicta, I think, in these cases, um, of the recruitment rationale um, that, the, that the court talked about in Will. And both Justice Breyer writing for the court in Hatter and Justice Scalia uh, in dissent uh, say that the recruitment rationale is still important for purposes of compensation clause analysis. And I want to take just a few minutes uh, to explain um, why we think that that's wrongheaded and misguided. Um, now, um, the question involved in these cases is whether people who are on the bench or who are thinking about going on to the bench will decide either to stay or to accept appointment because of the tax burdens that come with the salaries. Now, judges and potential judges have been complaining about their salaries forever. And let me say, often with good reason. Um, Justice Story, we heard some reference to earlier. Justice Story was, was reluctant, as Professor Amar said, uh, to assume, to take uh, an appointment to the Supreme Court because of the uh, failure to raise salaries since 1789. Um, more recently, um, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who talked a lot about, about compensation, and by the way, Chief Justice Roberts in his first uh, State of the Judiciary Address picked up on that theme, but uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist noted that, um, that between 1969 and 2002, the real value of Supreme Court salaries had declined by 37 percent, and the salaries of lower court judges had de declined by almost 25 percent. Now, at the margin, of course, this may make a difference to someone in deciding, do I stay or do I take an appointment? Our concern is, although that may be a plausible thing for someone to consider, we're pretty skeptical that that's a plausible basis for applying the compensation clause. Um, after all, uh, as Chancellor Kent said that uh, removing the prohibition on increases in compensation from the first draft of the, what became the Compensation Clause was intended to make attracting qualified judges easier. That's not the same thing as saying that that's why the Compensation Clause was ratified or that it should be interpreted uh, in recruiting terms. Um, now, Eric and I differ on how much weight to put on the original understanding. Um, but whatever you think about the original understanding, we don't think that there's much of an argument for under any other plausible method of interpreting the Constitution uh, to use recruitment as a rationale for uh, applying the compensation clause either. Um, I guess what we'd say is, do we want people on the federal bench who are there because of the salary and who will leave only because of the salary. You know, Benjamin Franklin suggested that maybe the president shouldn't be paid, that, that the psychic income of being president should be enough. Now, we're not prepared to argue that psychic income is enough uh, to justify going on to the federal bench. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is something to the notion that public service has intrinsic rewards that ought to be factored into the calculus of do I go, do I stay. Um, even Charles Evans Hughes uh, suggested that uh, to attract good men and to secure efficiency, the honor and independence of the office are a far greater account than the emoluments that attach to it. Now, the court has suggested, in, as I said, in Will and in Hatter, that somehow the level of compensation is important to recruiting. 
But there's not very much evidence. Indeed, the court has never actually cited any evidence to the effect that the level of compensation actually does affect recruiting. Um, and Charlie Jay's wife, Emily Van Tassel, who's a very well-regarded legal historian, has actually looked over the years at why judges resign. And it turns out that there isn't very much evidence that judges are leaving the bench because compensation is too low. Maybe a handful, but this is clearly not a serious problem. Moreover, um, Adrian Vermeule uh, has suggested that the compensation clause might actually have the perverse effect of holding down judicial salaries because the compensation clause notice has a ratchet effect. Congress can raise salaries, can't lower them. Therefore, Congress might hesitate to raise salaries at, at various points because it knows that once the salary is raised, it's always going to be at least at that level. Except to the extent that we get into these arguments about when does a pay raise vest, therefore Congress might well simply say, let's leave things as they are because then we don't run afoul uh, of the compensation bar. Now, this suggests that the recruitment rationale is a shaky underpinning for the compensation clause. Nevertheless, and let me uh, suggest we'll just stop here, given what the Supreme Court has said in Will, given what the Supreme Court has said in Hatter, and given the long dissent that Justice Breyer wrote in the denial of certiorari in the Williams case the, in 2002, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that some judge who is sufficiently insulated from the slings and arrows of public opinion might actually raise such an argument uh, and be able to make a non-frivolous claim that, that withholding pay raises, withholding cost of living adjustments might violate the compensation clause. Eric and I are quite confident that this argument should fail, but who knows? Let me stop there and see if Eric wants to rebut anything that I've said, uh, or uh, if not, whether uh, Mark Miller uh, wants to take us to task. At this point, not that I know of, uh, there hasn't been that much litigation uh, on this, but, to, but uh, uh, I think the Williams case um, uh, went through the Federal Circuit, um, and uh, the Federal Circuit rejected the claim, and then the Supreme Court denied cert. Well, I would also like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me. Um, as a political scientist who works in the intersection of political science scholarship and legal scholarship, I think I bring a slightly different view. Um, and I'd also like to say that the paper on taxation and the compensation clause is really quite interesting. I know you had a, haven't had a chance to read it. I see my job as looking at... A, a question in the paper, can taxes be used as a weapon against the courts when Congress is unhappy? And I've entitled my remarks, When Congress Attacks the Federal Courts. And I want to broaden the discussion a little bit from taxes to salaries and appropriations and some other ways that Congress can take action against the federal courts when a determined majority in Congress is quite unhappy with the courts. Now, this paper on uh, taxation and the compensation clause is part of sort of a broader family of works looking at the interaction between different institutions of government. And again, as a political scientist, I don't think that we can understand the courts in isolation. I think in order to understand and study the courts, we have to look at the way they interact between and among other institutions and other actors of government. And there is a, and we heard earlier, there's also another family of work that says that the court is not necessarily the last word on interpreting the Constitution. 
And I'm very much part of that governance as a dialogue movement where, I mean, one qu small quibble I have with the paper that we heard previously was that the court has said that judges must pay taxes like every other citizen unless those taxes are discriminatory against judges. And I agree that the court said that it had her, but I disagree that that might be the last word. I think that it's possible that a determined majority in Congress might ignore that and at some point might use the tax code to really attack federal judges and attack them for decisions that they don't like. Now, in the, govern in the uh, governance as dialogue movement, those of us who believe that the court doesn't necessarily have the last word, we really see this as, if you will, a multiplayer game where constitutional interpretation is pronounced by a president or a Congress or a state legislature or even interest groups. The court makes a statement and then there's a response from Congress, the executive, executive branch agencies or others. And that it, the real process of constitutional interpretation happens through this process, through this dialogue, if you will, this multi-member game. Now, to understand the context of this multi-member game at the moment, I think we need to step back a step and understand that relationships between the court and the Congress are at one of their highest points of conflict right now. Um, in fact, um, Justice O'Connor has said that she has not, in her lifetime, has not seen such a period of conflict. Lyle Dennison, who is a reporter for, um, most, was with the Boston Globe, was also with the Baltimore Sun, has covered the U.S. Supreme Court for quite a few years. And at a conference a couple years ago put on by the American Judicature Society, said in his 56 years of journalism, he had never seen tension so high between Congress and the courts, and especially with the potential attacks on the judiciary. And he was really worried, and I think many people are worried, about judicial independence when Congress is as angry as some appear to be. Now, Chief Justice Rehnquist, in many of his year in reports, talked about the relationship between the courts and Congress. He talked a lot about judicial salaries, but he also talked more generally about the relationship. And in, the late, and in Chief Justice Roberts' first year-end report, he also talked about the relationship between the federal courts and Congress. A lot of federal judges that I've talked to at various events are very uneasy about what's happening and about where this relationship's going. Now, tensions between Congress and the courts have obviously been high before. Um, tensions in the, after the Dred Scott decision through Reconstruction, when the radical Republicans in Congress were really worried that the court would attempt to declare the Reconstruction Acts unconstitutional, that was certainly a period of tension. Certainly a period of tension during the early part of the 20th century, progressives were furious that a conservative, that an activist conservative court was interpreting um, a freedom of contract to prevent any government regulation of the economy. And of course, in the 1930s, President Roosevelt was upset with the court because it kept declaring the New Deal to be unconstitutional. His famous court packing plan, plan failed in Congress, one of the few legislative defeats for President Roosevelt in Congress. But then we had the magic switch in time that saved nine, where the court finally declared the New Deal constitutional. And of course, in the 50s and 60s, social conservatives were quite upset with a whole range of liberal activist decisions from the Warren Court, right? And today, we're in an odd period um, Thomas Keck has a new book out called The Most Activist Supreme Court in History. And we are in a period where the, the Rehnquist Court was practicing liberal judicial activism and conservative judicial activism simultaneously. In fact, between 1995 and 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court declared more acts of Congress unconstitutional on a per case basis than they had ever in history before. So we're in a period of high tension. 
Now, I should also give you a disclaimer. When political scientists use the term judicial activism, we tend to use it as a descriptive term and not as a pejorative. We see judicial activism when the Supreme Court is making policy, when the other branches either will not or cannot, and generally, depending on the ideological direction of the case, we term it activism whenever the Supreme Court declares an act of Congress or an act of the states unconstitutional. So we tend not to use that term with the same connotations that the general public uses that term. Nevertheless, the judicial activism of the Rehnquist Court has created great tensions in Congress. Now, can the, will the Congress use the tax code to attack the courts? Maybe that's far-fetched. But they have used salaries. The Compensation Clause does say that Congress cannot reduce federal salaries, but it doesn't say anything about giving them annual cost of living increases or giving the courts adequate money for clerks or staff or computers or technology or courthouses. Both through the salary provisions and through the appropriations provisions, we have seen Congress attack the courts, and we assume that's in part because of the activism of the courts. Now, I argue that Congress and the courts have a different institutional perspective, a different institutional culture, and a different institutional will. In fact, the two institutions don't necessarily understand each other very well. They don't really understand how the other makes decisions or why they do so. And I think that's very clear when it comes to things like judicial salaries and appropriations. The courts rightly see themselves as an independent, co-equal third branch of government who deserves respect from Congress, especially when it comes to budgets. Congress, however, sees the courts as another federal agency with their handout as begging for money. So especially when we're talking about salaries, especially when we're talking about appropriations, I think that's when we see the clash of the institutional wills and institutional cultures between these two institutions. Now let me give you some example on salaries, for instance. 1964, many in Congress were quite upset with a lot of decisions that have been handed down by the Supreme Court, an activist war in court. They, of course, could not reduce salaries for Supreme Court justices, but this is what they did. They increased salaries for lower federal judges in that year by $7,500, and they increased judicial salaries for the U.S. Supreme Court by only $4,500. That $3,000 differential was a very clear message to the Supreme Court. Congress was not happy with them. And nothing in the Compensation Clause prevents them from doing that. Now, we've also heard about some of the cases on taxation. Also, the question was, if Congress announces in something like the Ethics and Government Act that federal employees, the president, legislators, federal judges, will probably receive, actually the act said more than probably, will receive annual cost of living increases, what happens if Congress cancels those previously announced increases? And the court has said, that's not a problem. Now, I think Congress was canceling those increases because they were trying to stop their own pay raises. And federal judges were just included in the mix. But Congress could always have given federal judges pay raises and prevented their own. They didn't do that. And so we have several years, four years in fact, in the late 90s, where Congress specifically refused to grant pay raises, cost of living adjustments, to federal judges that had been previously announced in the Ethics and Government Act. Was that an attack on the courts? Was that merely an attempt to, to say to their constituents, we're not taking a pay raise for ourselves? It's not clear. But I think we can see that salaries can be used as a weapon by Congress when a determined majority wants to. General appropriations for the courts have also been used. Um, for, and in Chief Justice Rehnquist's year in reports, if you haven't read them, they are fascinating. They're available at the Supreme Court's website, which is 
SupremeCourtUS.gov, but they're, you have to dig a little bit. They're under the public affairs links. If you haven't read the year-end reports that the Chief Justice gives every year, usually December 31st or January 1st, they make fascinating reading and understanding the relationship between the courts and the Congress. And salaries have been an issue for every one of those reports I've read, but also general appropriations have been an issue. Um, for example, the, one, of the, for one of the problems, I guess, that federal courts have in the appropriations process, and this has been a real problem for the courts in the last five or six years especially, is they really don't have any advocates in the court. And the appropriations process provides a clear way for us to see how the different institutional perspectives work. But let me give you a quote from a former chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee with jurisdiction over the judiciary. Congressman Smith said, quote, the courts do not have many advocates in Congress. They do not have a constituency. Congress continues to pass more and more laws that requires the courts to assume jurisdiction of more cases and add to their workload. Congress is eager to authorize more judges. But when it comes to paying for them, the members of Congress do not think that is a very high priority. And the appropriations process has really been very difficult in the last several years. Traditionally what happens is the courts propose a budget to the president. The president then, in, by tradition, sends that budget directly to Congress. By tradition, Congress enacts that budget without changes. In the last few years, that has not been happening. The courts have been receiving less money than they've asked for. And it's been a very difficult time with the federal courts having to cut their budgets, having to cut their personnel. Chief Justice Roberts, in his year-end re year report, was especially concerned about something that is within the direct control of Congress, how much rent the federal courts pay to the General Services Administration, who owns many of the courthouses and other buildings. The Department of um, Justice pays about 1 to 2 percent of their budget in rent to the GSA. The courts are paying, I believe, 25 to 30 percent of their budgets in rent to the GSA. And Chief Justice Roberts said, this is clearly a backdoor attempt to send a message to the courts that Congress wants change. Now, in the fiscal year 2000, the Senate actually voted to cut $280 million from the little over $4 billion that the courts wanted. And many, um, Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist was so outraged that he actually sent a letter to then Majority Leader Trent Lott of Mississippi at calling the Senate actions, quote, unjustified and impractical. And the federal courts were able to get newspaper editorials around the country denouncing the, bu the budget cuts. The last several years, things have been equally bad for the budgets of the courts. This is a clear way, I think, that when Congress is upset, they can take action. Now, there are obviously other ways Congress can take action. It's beyond my time and, and the scope of the paper here to go into too many more of them. Congress can, of course, attempt to restrict the jurisdiction of the courts, so-called court stripping plans. Congress can... Um, do all sorts of things like divide the Ninth Circuit in half because they find it too liberal. They can do all sorts of other things to the courts. But one of the things that they've been threatening, or at least some members of Congress have been threatening, is impeachment of judges because of their decisions. Former House Majority Leader Tom DeLay has openly called for the impeachment of judges who disagree with his view of what a good judge does. And the Terry Schiavo case raised all sorts of questions about whether judges should be impeached. 
there is now a new house working group on judicial accountability whose sole purpose is to educate members of Congress and the public about judicial abuses, which they define as judicial activism. These members of Congress, after the Terry Schiavo case, and if you're not familiar with the Terry Schiavo case, um, there was a woman who was being kept alive by a feeding tube. Her husband requested that the feeding tube be removed. Her parents objected. Every court that handled the issue basically said the husband had the right to make the decision. Congress got involved, attempted to force the federal courts to get involved. The courts who got involved all objected. Federal judges objected to the congressional action. But after all of that mess, there were many conferences where a lot of conservative activists, many of them in interest groups, people like Phyllis Schlafly, people from a variety of conservative activist groups, all called for the impeachment of judicial activists, but they also called for the impeachment of someone I would not term a radical person, Justice Kennedy, in part because I think we'll hear in a bit because of his views on citing international precedent, but also in part because he said that death penalty for juveniles was unconstitutional. We had a chief of staff or a key senator saying, I think we should start impeachment. If we impeach 30 or 40 of them, maybe the rest of them will retire. <laughs> chief Justice Rehnquist has always said, in several books that he wrote, said that impeachment should not be used as a political weapon. The impeachment of Justice Chase in 1803, I believe the date was, where the House brought articles of impeachment, but the Senate refused to remove, is the story that Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist always told. But there is real fear and concern out there that these threats of impeachment will become more than threats. And also, things like Congress passing the so-called Feely Amendment having the Justice Department and Congress maintain lists of federal trial judges who deviated from the federal sentencing guidelines. No explicit threat of impeachment. But Chief Justice Rehnquist was so concerned that in one of his year-end reports, he said, we cannot attack the independence of the judiciary this way. So the tensions have escalated. The tensions are real, and Congress has quite a few weapons that it can and perhaps will use against court individual judges in reaction to court decisions that they don't like. Now, again, as we heard first thing in this morning, today, because the court is both a conservative activist court and a liberal activist court simultaneously, both sides are upset. I do note that Senator Specter, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, asked then Judge Roberts, what are your views on congressional power? Which, of course, I read, are you a conservative activist? And liberals in the Senate have clearly been focusing on the conservative activism in federalism cases and others. Conservatives in the Senate have, of course, focused on issues like school prayer and abortion and the sodomy cases. But the question I ask is, even though the Supreme Court has said, as the uh, and, and Jenkins paper clearly said, that using the tax law as a weapon would violate the compensation clause, will that stop a, mater a determined majority who's upset with the courts and has a different understanding of judicial independence than most political and political, most legal scholars and political science scholars? Thank you. to go until 3 o'clock, so we have a bit of time. Or is that right? Actually, I think I will, I will jump in temporarily oh, um, change my status uh, as potted plant, potted in, a, uh, <laughs> potted in a horticultural sense rather than the other, other possibilities, just to make a, a couple of responses uh, to, uh, to Mark's very helpful comments. Uh, 
I guess my, my one response is that, in a way, I think we have seen all of this before. Um, and, and, and Mark noted that there have been a number of periods in, in U.S. history when um, congressional unhappiness with the Supreme Court has been extraordinary. Uh, one period that I'm, I'm uh, quite familiar with is the, the late 1890s, early 1900s. Um, <clears throat> Following the enactment of the 1894 income tax, the first really modern in, in, income tax, the Supreme Court struck down the tax in 1895, and the discussions in Congress about, about the income tax to begin with and what the Supreme Court had done about the income tax uh, involved a level of vitriol that makes uh, today's discussions actually look like very polite Victorian, Victorian tea parties. So in a sense, I think we might be worrying more than we need to, which is not to say that we should condone uh, the rhetorical overkill that has been has been has become common in Washington, but again, we have been we have been there uh, before. I guess one thing that Professor Miller's paper may may have shown is that our focus on the potential use of taxation or discriminatory taxation against uh, the federal judiciary is focusing on an issue that really isn't that important in the greater scheme of things. Uh, it was it seemed to be significant, very surprising in 2001 when the Supreme Court in the Hatter case decided that the extension of the old age survivor's disability insurance tax to, uh, to the federal judiciary was in fact discriminatory and therefore contrary to, uh, contrary to the compensation clause. But one of, our prime, one of, one of um, John Anton's and my primary arguments in our paper is that that's, an, that's the sort of issue that just simply is not going to arise again. The likelihood of overtly discriminatory uh, taxation directed at, at, at the federal judiciary is really, I think, non-existent, or at least it is, is, it, is extremely, it is extremely unlikely. Something like that could not happen surreptitiously, I think, and it's just inconceivable to me that there could be a direct tax on the judiciary, uh, judiciary using, um, using the, tax, the tax system. Um, and so, therefore, if, if we, there really is reason to be concerned about, about uh, congressional attacks on the judiciary, I guess what we ought to be looking at is the, the other possibilities that Professor Miller, Professor Miller has uh, su suggested. And for that matter, I think that those are actually indications that to the extent there's a real concern, real concern here, it's not a concern associated with, ta with taxation. If Congress wants to attack the economic position of the federal judiciary, it has a very straightforward way of doing that, which is to say not giving the judiciary raises, uh, attacking the economic position in a relatively backdoor way by imposing a discriminatory tax on the uh, judges, even if that were, that were permissible after Hatter, it seems to me, just isn't going to happen because it doesn't make sense for Congress to proceed in that way, even if it is going to act in the most openly hostile way imaginable. Let me make just one quick point. I also appreciate Professor Miller's list of additional mechanisms that Congress or, or, or the public might use as a way of getting back at the judiciary. I am struck, however, that in that whole list, one of the things that has not been suggested is to require a larger majority of the Supreme Court to invalidate a law under the Constitution. That was a suggestion that was actually floating around in the 1930s before the court packing plan. And just to make a kind of a local connection, um, in 1912, the progressive Ohio Constitutional Convention proposed and the voters adopted a very convoluted supermajority requirement for the Ohio Supreme Court that remained on the books until the late 1960s. To give you an idea how this worked, many of you know Map Against Ohio as a Fourth Amendment case. It was originally litigated primarily as a First Amendment case. Uh, Dolly Map was busted under the Ohio obscenity law. Uh, and if you read the Ohio Supreme Court opinion, you will see in the First Amendment section that the court says uh, the defendant argues that this statute violates the First Amendment. Here's the argument. Here's why she's right. Oh, by the way, um, only four of us out of seven uh, believe that. And under the Ohio Constitution, we need six. Therefore, her argument is rejected. Um, and uh, as I said, it, a very convoluted arrangement um, didn't work very well. Um, 
And I am struck that while we have all this controversy about, about supposedly activist courts reaching indefensible conclusions, this sort of institutional mechanism or, or something similar to it does not seem even to be on the radar screen. Except that legislation has been introduced by this House Working Group on Judicial Accountability to allow a two-thirds vote of both houses to automatically overturn any constitutional decision of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, and this was introduced by Congressman Ron Lewis of Kentucky with almost all the members of the House Working Group on Judicial Accountability as co-sponsors. I guess one thing I didn't say that I've written elsewhere is that even though there are all these verbal and rhetorical threats against the court, most of the time, Congress doesn't pull the trigger. Most of the time, Congress doesn't really attack the institution in institutional terms. I'm worried that those, those times are changing, but we, for those of you who were around, you know the impeach Earl Warren movement after Brown versus Board, and if conservatives are calling for the impeachment of Justice Kennedy, not to mention what they say about Justice Souter, <laughs> I worry, but, but, I, but I agree with you that usually Congress doesn't pull the trigger that there, these attacks do not get enacted into the law. However, there have been some court stripping proposals that have been enacted recently that are worrisome. There were calls for impeachment of the so-called nullifying justices in the Pollock cases, the, the income tax cases in 1895 as well, going back to my previous point that in a sense we've heard all of this before. Um, calls for impeachment coming from members of Congress at the time also call, I call for impeachment of the nullifying judges by uh, someone whose name will mean something to the law students in the audience, uh, former Oregon Governor Penoyer of the great case of <laughs> Penoyer versus Neff. Uh, I'll let my voice drop. Good. Let's see if there are questions, and remember to please wait for the microphones. The constitutionality of depreciation allowances is not on the table here. Okay. <laughs> Mark, this is sort of addressed to you and, and, and John as well. I mean, you had talked in terms of Congress not having pulled the trigger yet, but maybe that will change. My concern has always been maybe they, oftentimes they just don't need to. That, that John had talked about Madison's attempts to keep, uh, in the, Madison's attempts to basically prevent not just downward adjustments to salary, but to prevent upward ones. And it seems to me that maybe on some level he got it right, because his concern was that by allowing for upward adjustments, it would put judges in the position of going hat in hand to Congress. Uh, and saying, please, please, oh, please feed me. Uh, and that, uh, that when I was on the Hill, it was kind of humiliating to watch these judges walk the Hall of Congress with their hat out, saying, boy, has it gotten bad. Um, in that, the, the, at, at that point in the early 90s, there wasn't a lot of hostility toward Congress, so it just looked a little unseemly. But in this day and age, where you've got people like Representative Steve King saying, let's wait till their budgets dry up, that'll get their attention, that in that context, you don't need to pull the trigger. These guys are there saying, if we hope to get a salary raise, and we're now 37% or whatever below where we used to be, uh, maybe that's, that's enough. And, and with all due deference to John, I mean, 100 years ago, they didn't, you know, these judges didn't have to worry about putting three kids through college at $40,000 a pop. So, I mean, losing 37% of your real income, may, the honor may be there, but private practice is looking a whole lot, uh, a whole lot, whole lot better. Well, let me say a couple of things in response. One is, if you're not aware, Every year, at least one and often two justices of the Supreme Court walk across the street and testify before the House Appropriations Subcommittee uh, that handles the judiciary, basically with hat in hand. Uh, and all of these year-end reports always talk about it. The administrative office of the federal courts is actually the lobbying arm of the federal courts now, and they spend a lot of time dealing with things like judicial salaries. Um, I do disagree with uh, John a little bit in that Chief Justice Rehnquist and others thought that judges were leaving the bench because of their financial situation. And that is also in the year-end reports. So I'm not so sure that that's not so true. But I think you're absolutely right that the threat of Cong that the courts are very aware that Congress is playing games with their budgets. They're playing games with their salaries. They're playing games with their budgets. They haven't made real threats that they've carried out yet, 
but I think you're right, they don't have to. Just by delaying the judicial budgets and just by cutting them, they are sending a message that the judges are unhappily receiving, I think. Uh, let, me, let me raise a question. I think you're all wrong, okay? It's late <laughs> in the day. Let me tell you why. Um, the, the reason is that you cannot pinpoint to individual justices or judges what they should do if you're talking about X number of hundreds of judges. You just can't do it. So the fact that I, I feel sorry for going hat in hand, they're only making, what, 100 and, 180,000 and stuff like that, and they don't make it 4 million given their minds and all this stuff. But there's an inherent notion in what some of you are saying, and what you just said is that, aha, they're going to change their decisions because of this macro problem. But I don't think that's, I don't think individual judges change their position because of a general problem of making less money. In other words, you'd have to link up the movement with regard to pay to actually what the courts do. And if you do that, you would have to look at flows of judges that leave the federal court justice. Are judges, are they more liberal? Are they more conservative? You know what I mean? And start getting into that. Because you'd have to actually suggest that these changes, these macro changes in non-compensation is actually changing the behavior of judges individually as they make cases as, and, or do it at the level of judges leaving and therefore, you know, we have different cases, different outcomes. Well, moreover, to the extent that we have overly entrenched uh, judiciary now, as some people think, maybe the fact that there is increasing turnover attributable to uh, compensation is not a terrible thing. Well, what if Congress at one time falls in love with judges? Could they exempt judges entirely from all forms of taxation? We don't see any reason why the compensation clause would would prevent that. There, I suppose somebody might make a different sort of argument about maybe some sort of equal protection claim or something like that. But, uh, but in, in fact, when the, the modern income tax was first enacted in 1913, the judicial salaries of judges were not subject to the income tax. Their income from other sources was taxed, but their judicial salaries was exempt, presumably because Congress then thought there was some question about whether constitutionally, even with the 16th Amendment, on the books that they could tax the, the salaries of federal judges. As the only living judge in this room, perhaps I could make a couple of comments. <laughs> First of all, can't speak from the federal standpoint, I can only speak from the state standpoint. You have to start with the legislature, where I served as a member 50-some years ago, and then you have to go to the judiciary. You go to the legislature, and the first comment I received when I was elected in 1950 was, we're paying teachers $1,500 a year down here, and I think that's too much. <laughs> That was the first comment I heard. Now, as a person who served on the judiciary here, and the only judge who ever resigned after being reelected only two months, twice, I had to resign in order to send my daughter to school here because they only pay judges 34000 a year, and I couldn't support my family and send my daughter, who graduated from here in 78, to law school. So you have to look both places, to the legislature to get the money. And if you don't have million-dollar judges who are independently wealthy, they can't afford to live on the salaries that generally rural legislatures are willing to vote to. And I think that, you, that that's a real problem that you have to face in the state. I can't speak specifically okay. to the federal. I, I think it's certainly the case that the, the data we've seen deals with the economic effects on federal judges, we, the situation at the state level might well be different. And let me just talk my home state of Massachusetts. Um, the, we're, there's an interesting relationship between the state Supreme Court and the legislature in Massachusetts, as well as the rest of the state courts, in part due to small cases like same-sex marriage and um, campaign finance reform. But one of the things in our state is that the legislature has line item per courthouse 
and the legislature can force judges to hire clerks of their choosing and force judges to hire staff of their choosing. And the legislature rewards judges with more staff with whom they agree and, dis and punishes um, judges with fewer staff with whom they disagree. And this is very common in my state of Massachusetts. <laughs> a liberal state only in a very awkward sense of the word liberal. Uh, you either agree with them there or you don't. Uh, <laughs> I come from New Hampshire. Uh, uh, so, so you obviously don't have, uh, have a, a, an unbiased perspective on this, that's Marshall. Right. <laughs> I mean, what about baselines? I mean, there's a, the economist on our faculty is suggesting one of the reasons why judges might, wanna, might be happy receiving less is because of the power that they're able to exercise. You call that psychic psychic yeah. benefits, which is a real one. And if that's true, then isn't the appropriate baseline what Congress gets? Because they're essentially doing the same kind of job that Congress is, that Congress is doing in terms of exercising political power. Well, I, I wonder about that, Bill. And the reason I wonder about it is that, that whatever good behavior means, it means that once you're there, it, as Akil said, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a sentence. Right. Whereas if you're a, if you're elected, if you're a member of Congress, you've got to worry about two years or six years out. Um, and so that might suggest that members of Congress should get more because yeah. their 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 job security is less. But they're getting less. The, the economic they are. OK. Better, but, no. OK. But they're they're, right. OK. So at least it's not inappropriate if judges are still getting. Right. Yeah. Right. Aren't congressional salaries tied? I mean, one of the problems judges feel is that they cannot get salary increases unless members of Congress do too. And that's one of the concerns that federal judges have. And their salaries are basically in the same ballpark that trial judge, uh, federal trial judges and senators are roughly equal. There's a little bit more disparity between Supreme Court justices and House members, perhaps but that their salaries have really been tied together uh, until the constitutional amendment was adopted that Congress cannot increase its salary until an election occurs. At, at least when I was working on the Hill, it looked like legislative salaries were really the driving force behind determining the proper form of judicial salaries. Well, I have a, a question if nobody else does. Um, do you view, this is for Professor Miller, do you view um, the Supreme Court's uh, incredible shrinking docket as having any relationship to um, the budget cuts sort of one way or the other, or is that a completely independent? Um, it's a very good question. Under Chief Justice Rehnquist, they were, the Supreme Court was taking half as many cases as Chief Justice Berger's court did. Um, if we knew more about why cases get the four magic votes for certiorari, maybe we could flesh that out a bit. I suspect that that has less to do with concern with Congress and more to do with a concern of only taking high, higher profile cases is sort of the way I think Chief Justice Rehnquist convinced us. But again, the Chief Justice is just one vote of nine. Why so few cases were getting four votes at the certiorari stage remains a mystery, I think. You know, if your salary isn't going up, one way of maintaining your general level of income is to cut down on the work that you do. <laughs> so. I think we can take uh, at least one more question. I mean, basically, at the Supreme Court, the main reason the numbers went down is because they gave themselves, uh, or the uh, Congress gave them certiorari jurisdiction, so they had complete control over their docket. They were always very unhappy about uh, substantial federal question. They, they had all sorts of reasons to get out from under it. But the other thing, the other transformation from inside the court, at least that I saw, was Justice Scalia was extremely interested in only taking cases where they could render kind of a Zeus-like uh, rule for all time. And so if you didn't have an adequate split, you really would not recommend cert. And so, you know, the, the clerks developed all of these adjectives for, you know, uneven split, lopsided split, 
uh, developing split, inadequate split. So, uh, which, which, you know, because you never, when, when you get that low down, now when I was clerk, it was 130 cases, but it's moved down to 80. But there's a real drive among the clerks not to recommend cert. If you've got 8,000 cases coming in and they only take 80, odds are you're going to be wrong if you recommend a grant. So you start looking for more and more cert splits. And so that kind of, that philosophy, I think, was really pushed by Justice Scalia, but it was, certainly was agreed to by Rehnquist. And maybe, now that Justice Blackmun's papers are available, I haven't had a chance to look at them, and I don't know if others have, but now that Justice Blackmun's papers are available, because he was a meticulous note taker on everything, um, I suspect we may be getting, we probably political scientists will be at the lead of that, although the journalists seem to be out in front of us. With, if you've seen Linda Greenhouse's book, Becoming Justice Blackman, or Joan Bakusip's book on um, Justice O'Connor, you know that they're really out in front of the academics in some ways. But Justice Blackman's papers may help us answer some of those questions as to why a dramatic drop. I mean, maybe it was Justice Scalia pushing for one thing and Chief Justice Rank was pushing for another. And the liberals on the court saying, we can't win, so why vote for certain? I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Great. Well, I would like to thank our um, very interesting panelists. Um, and we have a break until 3.15 now. Thank you.